we're here. And I really want to thank everyone that come. I've had a lot of fun hearing from a few people I knew a long time ago in the advertisement for this from Tabor days. So this, I just am thrilled to have all the people that have decided to join us tonight. Let me just share my screen here. Hopefully we can all see that well. And the, the difficulty of a webinar is that I don't get to see your faces so much while I'm talking. And I am sorry that the, um, my screen partly covers, let me see if I can change this to speak of you, can I? Um, hide thumbnail video, no, that doesn't work. You still need to see me. There we go. So hopefully you can see mostly my screen now. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. And again, thank you so much for your choice to come and for your choice to support the Center for Theology and Psychology with your presence. The workshop tonight, I'd like to just give a brief overview. We'll, we'll introduce it with talking about how theology and science can work together in discovering truth. And there'll be two main sections, choose which thoughts to believe and evaluate default thinking, followed by a Zoom breakout time. And then the second section will be let hope lead, draw you into love's presence and a very brief conclusion that we would seek to be transformed to love what God loves and as God loves. Our key scripture for tonight, which won't surprise you, is from Romans 12 verses one and two, that God has called us to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. And I would like you to notice that I'm using a color code the purple stands for things that are past, the green stands for things that are present, and the blue stands for things that are future. And you'll see an interweaving of those things as we go through this to get together tonight. So God has already shown us his mercy and our present response is to offer ourselves totally to him in an act of total worship. Our present response is to choose not to conform any longer to the pattern of the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, which is of course our central theme. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Theology and science have not always been good friends, even though the, the belief that God made an understandable, reasonable creation helped to give birth to science. And psychology is kind of coming back around to a bit more, um, recognition that there's not a complete alienation between theology and other ways of understanding the mind. The biblical renewal of the mind is approximated by some of psychology's understandings of the mind. Psychology can help us apply truth and it can be incredibly interesting the things that it reveals. It helps us to understand. But the key I would really like to keep in, in the center in this presentation and as we look at this scripture is that there is nothing that we can do by our own efforts to achieve the transformation God wants. We can cooperate with God who is acting with us to affect renewal in our lives by his grace, what he's already extended to us, his presence with us and his empowering. So this is very much a God and us enterprise. This is not a we can do this enterprise. Cognitive and psychodynamic psychologies have recognized that the past affects how we experience and think in the present. And we have faith in God's past actions and promises he made in the past but continue into our future, which can alter our present interpretations. In more recent years, mindful psychology has drawn us to focus on the present moment and often to do so by attending to what's very present in terms of our breath and our senses. But most importantly for us, we can be present relationally in love to the Lord who is here. He loves us and he's always with us. And that's our most important awareness in being mindful in the present. Neuroscience confirms that past thoughts do form pathways in our brain and that mindful presence can build new pathways. It also shows that we're drawn into the future we just naturally think about what, what's ahead, what we're gonna do next. And hope based on God's promises for the immediate future and forever opens possibilities to us in the present moment. So these will be some backdrop thoughts as we enter into our conversation today. We want to choose which thoughts to believe and evaluate our default thinking. 
returning to our, our central verse, to renew and be renewed, I've just kind of stretched it out a bit more here, uh, that we keep in view who God is and what he's done. And we're giving ourselves entirely in the present to God, remembering what God has called us to do in Jesus Christ, to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. The living sacrifice image is really very similar to this call of Jesus to take up our cross and follow him. In verse two, we have two actions to do not conform or refuse to conform any longer to the pattern of this world, which has mindsets and actions which oppose obedience to Christ. And 2 Corinthians 10 reminds us that we're to take thoughts captive that the world may have pressed upon us and cause them to obey Christ. But be transformed. And you notice that there's a passive in that, that I, I must actively yield to someone who is acting on me and with me to the living word. And you'll notice we'll refer quite a bit to the Bible itself. And we'll also refer quite a bit to the Lord who is the word. So it's that, that living and active word who is transforming our minds into his own mind, the mind of Christ, which we've already been given. First Corinthians tells us we've already got it but we need to be transformed into it in an effective way. And that process takes place by the renewal of our minds, which makes us become like Jesus, which is God's purpose for us. And uh, Romans 8, 28 says, God works all things together for good. And what is the purpose? That we might become more like him. And the more we're like him, the more we can enjoy intimacy within the fellowship of the Trinity, which he permanently and con continuously enjoys. So what this will lead us into an ability to think differently, we will be able to test and approve God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. And what, of, what, of the, what is that will? To desire to be with him, to desire to share his holiness and to be fruitful, his desires. There's a lot of words on this slide, but I just want you to notice there's two key passages here uh, from Hebrews chapter 6 and Philippians chapter 3. And I'd like to look at each of them for just a minute. Again, notice the color code um, that the green represents present things, that the purple represents past, and the um, blue represents maturity. So we're always in this, this time, unfolding time. The first few verses in Hebrews chapter 6 give us six fundamentals, which it says we're not to go about laying again. But we notice that those fundamentals include repentance and faith. And that's really the dying and living dynamic of Christianity. That as I repent, I die to myself, and I look to God, and he gives me resurrection life. So that's the, that's the dynamic that we live in, in which we become free to grow to maturity. In Hebrews 6, there's a reference to those who have made other choices along the way as a warning. And then it goes on to say, but we're confident of better things in your case. And I'd like to say I'm confident of that for those of you who are here tonight, because this is your desire for things that accompany salvation to grow and develop in your life. God is at work with you. He hasn't forgotten anything that you have brought of yourself to him. And we're encouraged to show diligence, to keep pressing to the very end, to that day when we might finish well and, and come into glory with him. And we can imitate those who have gone ahead, whether they're scriptural uh, stories or whether the people will know or read about, people that encourage us that we can keep going. I've just noticed at the bottom there that, that those six areas that are called foundations are, are expanded upon by an old teaching set by Derek Prince. And some of us haven't had lots of discipleship opportunity and the transferable concept is another way of gaining some basic discipleship stuff that's been around for a while. Bill Bright, who established uh, what's now called Power to Change. In Philippians, Paul says several times, I consider, I want you to notice that, that word consider, because uh, it's, it's taking, taking account of what's going on with our minds. I consider, in this case, Paul's talking about, I consider everything a loss compared to the greatness of knowing Christ Jesus. I've lost other things, but they're rubbish compared to him. I consider them rubbish. They might have been good things in my past estimation. They might be good things in the eyes of others. But to me, in comparison, I can consider them as a loss that is, is not that great of a loss to me compared to having 
uh, this new position of being found in Christ with his righteousness, not my own. That comes by faith. And Paul continues to say in what was probably a, a well, most of, one of the most well-known verses that I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to what is yet to come for us, which is that resurrection from the dead. And Paul, who God is using to write so much to us um, through Christ who lives in him, says, I'm not there yet. I'm not already perfect, but I'm pressing on. And what an encouragement to us to be pressing on. And he's pressing on to take hold of that which has already taken place. Christ has taken hold of me. So this is this wonderful dynamic of God has already done it. God is doing it. And we're joining with him so that it can be complete. There's a verse here that is sometimes misrepresented when people are thinking about growth, forgetting what is behind. That doesn't mean that we forget our stories. That doesn't mean that we forget things that, that still need to be um, worked through or healed. But it means we don't allow those things to dominate us anymore because our focus is toward who Jesus is. So we're straining toward what is ahead, pressing on, because God has called me heavenward. And so that assures me that it'll happen. And again, we're pressing on to maturity. And that, that depends on us taking cons considered views. And God will help us if our considered views need some alteration. So let's live up to what we've already attained, he says. Now, with that, I want to switch from looking directly at scripture to looking at the tenets of cognitive behavioral therapy. I was refreshed in this by a series by Dr. Jeff Riggenbach that is available for you to watch if you're interested on the CCA website. And he had this basic schemata here, event, thought, feeling, action, result, with a, a straight line of arrows. I've changed it a little bit because I think it's a little bit more complex in how feelings participate in the thought or cognition and action or behavior process. And feelings here I'm taking to mean both your emotions and your physical sensations. We find that there can be some interaction and the thoughts cannot always appear to have preceded the feeling. So the, the basic movement of cognitive behavioral therapy is that one could uh, take note in, in one's mind, consider, think, what am I thinking? And consider and evaluate that cognition and then move toward an action. So I would just like to, to notice in that basic movement that first I have to notice what's going on in my head and perhaps in my body and my emotions, take notice, then consider is what I'm thinking actually what I think would be helpful for me to think? Is it actually true? Is there another option in terms of thinking? So I consider. I consider what all of this is telling me and what I choose to believe. And then I make a choice about what thought I'm going to hold to with the idea then that that will affect my feelings. It, it may immediately, it may not immediately, but it will affect the choice that I make in terms of action. And action or movement can involve a change of, of your facial expression, change of your tone, change of the position of your body as well as something that you would consider yourself to do, to do or to say. And obviously what comes after that is always a new event. So I just want you to notice that when it comes to thought, there's the issue of interpretation. And we have the arena of interpretation and the arena of action. The past and the future are both outside of our control. And to some degree, our feelings are outside of our control as well. Um, but what we do have control over is what we choose to think and what we choose to do. Now, I've made a separation between two aspects of our thought process. There's the arena of interpretation number one, which I'm going to come back to more later. And this is related to an aspect of our brain that we're not always so well aware of, our middle brain, which is responding to things before we actually do have a conscious thought. So then by noticing the feelings, that are going on inside of us, we might get a clue that something is transpiring. And then there's the arena of interpretation too, where we, act, we do have conscious thought and uh, that we can actually notice more directly in terms of cognitive content. In both cases, 
we need to notice, consider, and choose our thoughts uh, prior to our choice of action. And if we've already had a pre-conscious reaction, then we can also include that in our choice our, um, in terms of our face, our tone, and our body when we move to the arena of action um, and, and decide what we want to do now. So once I'm aware of what's going on inside of me and have decided what is the best um, course, then I can act in it. There's a lot of in different influences on how we interpret things. Uh, some of them are event specific. In other words, they pertain to what's going on right now in this, in this event. And the others are the gospel context that you and I live in by the fact that Christ lives in us and we live in him. So event specific, that includes your present state. For example, did you get enough sleep? Are you hungry, angry, lonely, tired? What's your condition? And the context, uh, you expect different things in different contexts. You may expect to be relaxed or expect to be um, on your guard, depending on where you are. And then there's the information that are take, that's taken in by your senses. External being your five senses, your hearing, your touch, your smell, uh, and so on. And internal being what you become aware of inside your body, that what you notice in your gut or your chest, um, or where your body is in space. So those are uh, both present realities. There's also past associations, which we are constantly making in present situations. And some of them feel more like a trigger than, or in some of them feel like a, a gentler association. But what we perceive will connect to things that we've understood from the past. That, that can include beliefs about our relationships with others and with ourselves and with others' intentions perhaps towards us. That can include our beliefs about our capacity, about the task at hand, whether we think we're going to manage what's ever in front of us well, and beliefs about the future if we do or don't manage this as we would hope would be the, for the best. What, will it be a great result or will it be something catastrophic if it doesn't go well? And in terms of the events, the specific event also, to be able to distinguish what is presently true and distinguish that from the past, try to notice what is different, being able to notice what's different, really important and maybe come back to that. Then there's the gospel context. These things are true all the time. And to some degree, we can tap into them and it will help us if we can. So always God is who he is. His promises are what they are. And so being able to remind ourselves of those things uh, and to have both present confidence and future hope, to be able to trust that he's actually here now. We know that he is. Sometimes we can be more actually aware of that in our awareness. Um, the security that we have in God's love that he isn't going to let you go and that he intends your good. The confidence that you have because God has actually called you to be his and to serve him. And he's with you to empower you to do whatever needs doing. Assurance that God ultimately is in control. So outcomes are not completely up to you or to anyone else, but God is ultimately in control. And he already knows the outcomes. He already knows the future. And belief that others that are with you don't have to be seen as particularly intimidating or particularly anything. They're, they're equally human, equally needy, equally loved and humble love in God's, uh, God's ways wins. Just continuing on, there are thoughts that can trap us and thoughts and feelings that can free us. And I'd like to think with you together about a few of these things. The first of these potential traps are the thoughts that were formed when we were children. And that's from two different points of view. As children, we have developmental capacity and we also are in a context usually of dependency uh, where we're more vulnerable. Developmental capacity means, for example, that I at the age of eight cannot interpret the actions and motives of an adult in the same way as an adult can. Um, and I will see things and experience things differently than I might even as a teenager because of my developmental process. So I, I, may have, I may have got an opinion about myself or about others or about life that goes back to a time when I'm developmentally more, um, more unable to interpret than I would be in my adult capacity. And also I'm no longer a child, so I'm no longer in the same degree of helplessness as, as I may have perceived myself to be in the past. And, in 1 Corinthians 13, in the love chapter, Paul talks about 
the difference now compared to when we were children, it's time to, uh, to put away some of our child thinking and, and take on some of the thinking that is more appertained to being an adult. We also have vulnerabilities in our human frailty, such as um, I only have so much physical strength, I need to eat and sleep and so on, and uh, to be connected to others. And in our sinful nature, which is that bent that we have to pursue our own way and will, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. And Paul calls that the flesh or the sinful nature or the carnal nature. And Romans 8 talks about how we can set our minds on the carnal nature, which is death, or we can set our minds on the spirit of God, which is life and peace. So there's a, an important, again, mind-changing activity that can go on with respect to our sinful nature. There's the worldly values that we have all absorbed and can continue to absorb that may not have been submitted to God. They can sometimes be good things, uh, but um, out of order in terms of their priority. First John talks about how the things of the world are hostile to God, and that, that includes the, the, the desires and the lusts of the eyes and the flesh and the boasting of what we have and do. And thankfully, uh, John himself heard from the Lord Jesus that we can be of good cheer, that although we have tribulation in the world, Jesus has overcome. He gives us confidence that in him we can overcome too. And then there's the reality of evil spirits. Jesus dealt with them regularly. We know that they're, they're real. And 1 Corinthians 10 uh, reminds us how we can be vulnerable if we think that we're doing well. Uh, we could easily fall because our eyes might not be where they need to be. But God has provided a way to escape uh, temptation that may come our way. James talks about how our sinful nature and our worldly values can be at war within us. And we need to be able to humble ourselves and submit to God and then resist the devil from that position and he will flee from us. And 1 John in the, in the verses immediately prior to the ones talking about the world, talks about developmental growth as a Christian from being a child in, of God who knows the Father into a young man or young woman who is coming to know the word of God who dwells in us and able to uh, overcome the evil one. And then we grow into the the fullness of maturity to be a father and mother in Christ who knows him who's from the beginning. So these are influences on us that we may have to take captive, thoughts that we may need to take captive. And then there's thoughts and feelings that can free us. Most of us have experienced at some point in the presence of God in our lives, a sense of check that the Holy Spirit is, is going, nah, don't go that way, or release, like there's a freedom to go that way. So that, that sense of internal guidance from, from his presence. And there can be a sense of, um, of direction that comes from a scripture that comes to mind or a song that you may wake with or a story that comes back to you, whether one of the scripture or one that you know or you hear or a person, again, from scripture or one that you know or hear about or an action that comes to mind, things that are just kind of brought by the Holy Spirit's grace when we need them. And then of course, there's the voice of someone who desires your good, who is number one, the Lord himself. And also it may come through a, a person who loves you, a person of wisdom. So these are various influences on our interpretations. And then there's our actions. And there are some actions that are always possible, no matter what the circumstance is. And that, those are actions that pertain to myself, and also actions that pertain to others and outcomes. For myself, I can hold on to where I am in Christ, that I'm centered in him as me, and he's there with me, reminding myself that I belong to him and responding to him primarily, not to the external circumstances on their own, and cultivating always that intimacy with him and growth and learning to walk with him. I can do this with me in the middle of whatever my required actions may be. I can choose love, forgiveness, other fruit of the Holy Spirit in the way that I respond and how I respond. I can be truthful and speak only what I actually do know or know that I can do. I can live just this one moment before the next and take just this one step before the next and trust that the next will unfold. 
And then there are others and outcomes that I can make an, I can have an influence on for good. I can provide a good example by living out the fruit of the spirit and the way that I handle myself. I can aim myself, my calling and my abilities to serve and empower others. What, not, not for building myself up, not for making myself to be somebody. I can trust God that he can bear good fruit through my life, do something worthwhile through me, no matter how well-equipped or ready I feel. I can hope for good outcomes because my hope is steadfast in him. I can pray, being thankful that God already knows and he's already listening to me and he's considering and acting for good as we, as we look to him and as we are with him in the process. So these are things that can happen in any action. I'd just like to consider with you for a few minutes that we do get drawn by the goals that we have and some things that are considered to be very highly important in the world may actually look different when they get translated across into what God's goals are and God's values are. They aren't bad things, these things in the world, um, but they can become an idol to us and therefore become bad for us. So good things, we all want good things to happen. We all, we all want good to come our way. Uh, nothing wrong with that. We all want to be healthy in body, soul, and spirit and have healthy relationships. We want to not suffer. We want to be free from suffering we currently have. Uh, we like to have approval by others. We like to feel like we matter in the groups that we belong to. We want to be successful. We want to do well. We want to achieve goals. And we like to have the freedom to live as we choose. Nothing wrong with any of those things. But as servants of Christ, we need to consider that, that God's goals and purposes for us might look slightly different. For one, God wants to conform us to what Christ is like. And we know that Christ was continually uh, doing and saying what he heard the Father doing and saying. And he also was completely holy. He didn't sin. And God wants to transform us so that we can share his holiness, so that we can become more like him and enjoy more intimate fellowship with him. And also so that we can be more useful to him in serving others. He wants us, no matter what we're going through, to be able to worship him. Remember that presenting ourselves as living sacrifices is, is our reasonable worship, our reasonable service. And so we want to be worshiping, which actually is quite liberating and empowering for us. If we do this, it's not only God that benefits it's us. Worship is to pray with thanksgiving and in commune with him in all things. And sometimes our suffering draws us to, to think about how we need him. He wants us to desire to please him more than we desire for other people to be pleased with us. And he wants us to be fruitful in kingdom terms. He wants us to come into maturity in Christ likeness, individually and together, corporately. He wants us to be his servants, his ambassadors. Paul even refers to himself as a slave of Christ. So that's the future that, that can really inspire our hope. Now I'd like to just look here just briefly at a few of the, the inaccurate default thoughts that you and I can easily have or have had, which are thoughts by which we interpret the past and the present and anticipate a negative future and the possibility of thoughts that we can exchange them for. And I'm sure that you can think of others. I can't, I haven't yet. Lots of things I can do now that I couldn't do once. Christ is with me and I can if he wants it. You see the simple exchange there, practical examination. There's things I could do now that I couldn't do before. Christ is with me. I can do all things through him. It's a combination of practical wisdom and, uh, and godly anticipation of the goodness of God. It's too hard. It's difficult, but maybe I could learn in small steps. I'll learn lots of things in small steps. I shouldn't feel this way. Emotions, if that's what we mean, are not chosen. Thoughts are. Sometimes we say, I feel, but we say, I feel that, meaning a thought. But if it's an emotion, that's something that's there to alert me, not in itself something I control. I'm a failure. Uh, according to who? Who says so? I have succeeded at some things. Everyone here succeeded at getting themselves to this webinar tonight. God is my judge. He equips us to do what's important 
and necessary and he redeems whatever we haven't done so well or whatever we've botched up terribly. Compared to others, I'm weak, stupid, inferior, bad, ugly. I'm sure you can add words to that. Well, God actually likes variety. He likes us to be different to each other. And he might like your difference more than you think. And besides that, he redeems all and makes all things beautiful in its time. My sin cannot be forgiven. Hmm. No sin is more powerful than Jesus' blood. Everything's my fault. Hmm. You don't control everything. I have no choice. You choose how you respond. If anyone knew X about me, I would be shamed and unloved, and that would be intolerable. Jesus knows, and he accepts you and loves you. He will never leave you. Others said said about me or are demonstrated by their actions. Others are limited, self-preoccupied creatures too. And you don't know all that influence them, which means you can't really interpret what they're thinking. So these are, these are examples. I'd like now to go to a breakout room for about 10 minutes where you'll be with several others and you are not in, by any means required to be more personal than you would like to be. Um, but pick one, pick one of these default thoughts or some other default thought that you've experienced and consider how it predicts a negative outcome. And then consider together what biblical truth might challenge this thought. And we, we remember that, that it has to be something that's true and applicable and try to think how it reflects God's love and hope. So I'll just release you now to enjoy a few minutes talking with some of your neighbors. About 10 minutes. Hopefully this works. So far it hasn't. I'm sorry, I haven't got the control over it. There are much smarter people on here than me that are doing that. Well, I hope you enjoyed the breakout room and the people that you got to talk with and had some great ideas of what thoughts you could introduce to your mind to combat some of those other ones that tend to come in that default thinking. And so now we'll go to the second section, let hope draw you into love's presence and just reminding ourselves of, of these three things, faith, hope, and love, the greatest is love. Hope, our basis for optimism. Hope is actually available to us on two levels, hope for my present life and hope for forever. So what's my hope for right now? Well, number one, Jesus is with me, that I have such a wonderful close companion in him who will never ever leave me. So I'm not ever alone and never will be alone. Not only is he with me, but I'm in him and he's in me. And so there's that potential for him to work through me. And, uh, and to keep me close. And I'm seated in heaven with him, as well as being here. He's the one with all authority and he's interceding. Nothing can happen to me that doesn't go through him. Nothing can happen to you that doesn't go through him. God knows the end from the beginning. So I'm right now in the middle of it, but I can be confident that he knows and he's bringing all things together for good, even though I don't understand all things while they're happening. He knows me better than I do. And he chose me, adopted me into his family, and called me to bear fruit that lasts. That's a pretty great hope for the present. 
And God doesn't want anyone to perish. So we have hope for others. He's eager to draw others as we pray and love. There's always a purpose in us making that effort to pray and to love. And then there's our eternal hope that is something that gives us a projection that keeps us safe. I'll be with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit forever. So I don't have to be afraid of death. I've been delivered from the freedom of, from, from the slavery of the fear of death. And death is only the portal to greater intimacy and joy. I'll be with believers forever. No goodbye is permanent. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. I'll be reunited with those that I love. I'll recognize those that I have, have known here, as well as join those of all ages and places forever. The new, heaven, new heavens and new earth will lack none of the interest of the present ones, but be far better. So I really don't have to fulfill any bucket lists because it's gonna be good in heaven. There will be reward in heaven for whatever has been done in love here. Every cost will be worth it. There we will be whole, we'll know as we are known and we shall be like him. This journey, which seems like it takes, uh, takes so much and is never quite finished, will actually have a, a wonderful fullness and there will be no more pain not in us and our lives, not in anyone else's. Heaven will be quite different. Now I want to refer, coming from our, our scriptural foundation back to a psychological one. In the world of, of positive psychology, which is a more recent development, uh, there was some work from a, an understanding of learned helplessness to learned optimism, that in fact, helplessness tends to be our default and our optimism or our hope is more learned. And if you look at these three categories, the locus of control, duration, and extent, these were developed into a questionnaire called the attributional style questionnaire, attribution meaning explanation, which is available on the Positive Psychology website if people wanna do research with it, but I don't know if you can look at it just to see what the questions are. But in the helplessness and hopelessness side, the person thinks that the problem is within. It's there's something wrong with me. I'm the reason that things are going so badly. Uh, whereas on the hopeful side, there's an ability to identify that there are external factors that are contributing to this problem. The duration on the helpless side is forever. Whatever's wrong with me, it's causing this problem is going to always be that way. Whereas on the hopeful agency side, there's a recognition that there are circumstances here that are temporary that are causing this particular challenge. And then extent. The cause of the problem on the hopeless, helpless side is global and pervasive. It doesn't matter what situation I go into, I'm always going to have this because of the problem that I carry within myself. And on the other side, extent, the cause of situation specific. There are, there are factors here that won't be true in other situations. So if a person tends towards the cluster on the left side of your screen, it tends to give you a pessimistic style. And on the, if you tend toward the cluster on the other side of the screen, it's more of an optimistic style. And they postulated that those who had a more pes pessimistic style would be more vulnerable to depression when they enc encounter difficult circumstances than people on the optimistic side. And in fact, that bore out to be true. So to be able to, to challenge the kinds of thoughts with reasonable truth um, that are on the left side is really important for how you encounter stress. So in the arenas of interpretation and action, again, um, we, we have those middle brain elements, which I want to look at in a moment. And then the elements that we are consciously aware of where we choose. I want to look at the middle brain elements for a couple of minutes because this has actually helped to explain part of what I had in the past found dissatisfying about cognitive behavioral psychology. And that's that people can't always identify a thought that precedes a feeling. And there's actually some good physical reasons for that. And as we're coming to understand our, our brains and bodies, a bit more thoroughly and that we need to understand them. There's some useful information here. So our central nervous system includes our brain, which is no longer just a, an empty black box that we don't know how to learn from, but uh, something that people can learn more directly from in neuroscience. Our spinal cord and our peripheral nervous system. 
And that nervous system is divided into the senses, the sensory division and the motor or action side. So, so on the sensory side, it's what I take in from outside the five sen senses and what I take in from my internal experience, which is where I am with re reference to gravity, where my limbs are in space. And again, that gut feeling, that tightness in your chest or the butterflies in your stomach, for example. So those are my senses. And all that information feeds into my middle brain, the limbic system, before it gets to the rest of my brain. So that's really important to remember that middle brain gets that information. And then there's the, the motor division side of the brain, the somatic nervous system, which is the voluntary control. You know, I can move my finger and so can you with the, the muscles that, that are striated that give us voluntary control. And then there's the autonomic nervous system or the ANS. And the critical thing to know here is we don't actually have voluntary control over that. That's when the middle brain is assessing the information that's coming into it and engineering some primitive memory responses. And it branches out into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system, which I want to look at with you for a couple of moments. So on the sympathetic side, um, if I'm experiencing stress, my brain will, will initiate a pattern of chemicals that will help me to respond to that event. On the parasympathetic side, when I'm experiencing rest or relaxation, my brain will initiate a different set of chemicals. So the stress can be positive or negative. Uh, a lot of the ones on the sympathetic side we would see as, as negative, but not all, helping us to, to meet challenges, including uh, what would be a very positive experience for many of sexual climax, but also the negative experience of anxiety, panic, terror, rage, desperation, and the ability to get my muscles, my striated muscles moving in quick, quick smart when needed, and also um, happening in different parts of my body with heart rate and so on. So in general, it, it causes my body to get faster and produces symptoms like I had when getting ready for tonight where my, my skin got cold and my palms got sweaty um, as we are, are thinking about something that we feel a bit of stress about. On the parasympathetic side, uh, most of our other emotions sit there. Um, more, re more relaxing experience of emotion. The time that it's not about relaxing so much uh, even though some of those can be quite un uncomfortable emotions, is when the sympathetic s system's ability to prevent harm hasn't been enough to deal with the, comp the, the thing that actually happens. And then the, the parasympathetic is activated at the same time. So you got chemicals coming from both directions uh, to, to basically initiate a harm minimization, which we can experience as a freeze. And you can just basically say this side goes slower. And if it's in, the, in a situation where we are actually freezing, it goes slower still. This is one way of looking at that ANS activation. And it's actually having an impact on my cognition and my affect or emotion and my body. So if you look at the bottom line, that's kind of your, your position of rest, parasympathetic activation. The upper line is the direction of sympathetic activation. And um, that in between is the window of tolerance where we can basically function and do our lives well without feeling that it's too much. But when, when we're arising to an occasion, the fight or flight um, and recovering in a general flow of meeting challenges and going through life, we're able to think and feel and act comfortably. But if something is getting to be too much, you're in, a, in an argument, for, for example, that you're having trouble resolving, there's an intensification which becomes hyperarousal. And in that we can become, and I'm sure everyone else knows what this feels like besides me, reactive, disorganized in our thoughts, racing, our emotions can be overwhelmed, we can be uh, panicky or our anger can turn to rage. Um, and we can become, particularly if it's chronic, hypervigilant, where we're constantly on alert, looking for signs of threat or danger. Not a very comfortable place to be. Now we can come back to a, a tolerable place from that, and most of us do. And I often encourage people to take a time out from a discussion where 
either, either one or the other is experiencing it. We often call it flooding um, so that you can calm down and be able to regroup. But it can become something that is more intolerable. And at that point we can freeze kind of like an animal caught in headlights or you know, on alert to take note, what are they sniffing, what's in the air. And the freeze can be followed by a crash. And if, if it is followed by a crash, in that position that the parasympathetic chemicals are going as well, and the person cannot think well, is, is, is feeling numb, shut down, disconnected. And remember, this is involuntary. Uh, it's a harm minimization type of position where a person can't say no because you actually don't have the voluntary capacity to do it. Um, but that also can lead a person to feel quite ashamed because they can't, um, can't stop something that they would like to be able to stop. Um, may collapse or fragment, that's where dissociation takes place. We see this when people experience trauma. So the feelings of ANS activation may provoke certain thoughts, uh, particularly we might associate some of them with the thoughts that are common to anxiety or common to depression. And generally speaking, if somebody, for example, has medication for depression, they'll find that it's addressing both anxiety and depression. Um, so anxiety, the, the fight flight system on overdrive is, is, is when we're, it, we're anxious to prevent something negative from happening. And depression is often a, a sense of things just are negative and I can't, I can't stop that being the case. I'm just trying to survive it. So we see these, these ANS symptoms of a sympathetic activation often present in anxiety. We see symptoms that are more flat and numb and heavy often when people are depressed. Um, it doesn't mean they're in a crash state necessarily but it has some similarities in terms of what it feels like. Um, and those kind of thoughts, the thoughts that are, that are oriented towards avoid, prevent, stop, uh, and the thoughts that are, avoid, that are more oriented towards hopeless, um, that's no use, you know, I'm defective, uh, which are more common to depression. So we can think that perhaps our ANS is having some influence on, on our minds, as we noticed in that earlier one where I said the middle brain can be causing a quick assessment. And if, the, if that's happening, there's an action that's taking place with, with chemicals being released and sometimes jumping back. And a good example might be if you're driving a car and something is suddenly coming at you, you might swerve or break before you actually register in your mind, something is coming at me because your ANS, your, your middle brain is going, swerve, get out of the way, without, without you having cognition necessarily, but it's producing an action. And then we have a reaction to our ANS's effect on our bodies. For example, somebody walked in a room and immediately um, there's something about this environment that's feeling risky and dangerous and they're having um, a scary reaction. And then they start to react to the reaction. Oh gosh, I've, I'm now reacting because I feel these reactions. Um, and that can be true of depressive feelings as well. So our central nervous system is functioning with various hormones that are affecting changes in our bodies. And we've noticed that they can associate with some of the emotions and thoughts that we're dealing with. Now, if the brain detects something that's reminiscent of past trauma, as with that squiggly line further down might be the case, um, the actions to defend may be larger than the present may warrant, which can feel a bit crazy and look a bit crazy if it's actually larger than the situation warrants but it feels alarming to the person because it's, it's ringing those alarm bells, danger, 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 watch out, watch out. Um, so, so trauma can have that relived experience for people if there's something similar that the brain picks up on. There's also another thing going on in our brain, which is quite fascinating called mirror neurons, which helps us to connect to other people, helps us to empathize with other people. Um, so we might actually, in talking with someone, take on their facial expression or their body posture and start to feel what they're feeling and adjust our tone and so on to those people. And we may not be actually too conscious of doing it. And if we're unconsciously doing it, we can be mirroring their externals and picking up their internals without quite, as in their thoughts and feelings, without quite realizing what's going on for us, that it's actually somebody else's stuff that's affecting us. So, so that helps us to notice that facial and body positions both emerge from and evoke feelings and thoughts. So say for example, if, 
if I was to be feeling sad or depressed, I might become quite kind of droopy and have a sad face. But I could also become droopy and have a sad face and start to feel those feelings, um, which might have happened, for example, while I'm empathizing with someone. And it's very interesting that, that some of these things, because they are so connected to the bodies that we humans universally have, they're cross-culturally recognizable. Uh, are, and they're recognizable through facial expressions, body postures, and gestures, such as, you know, people recognize that to worldwide. Um, so the key here to all these things is that we, we notice that they're going on. So we can take them into our consideration as we're choosing what we're going to think and how we're going to act. And just as a, a two second pause, why don't you check your posture right now and your facial expression? And try sitting up a little bit straighter, smiling. You may feel more confident. Just see how you feel. So emotions, as I've said, are, are not to be seen as dangerous in and of themselves or negative in and of themselves because we see them throughout the scripture, the Psalms and, and uh, Jesus himself uh, demonstrate the majority of emotions. So I'd just like to look at a couple of them and think about how we can, as we are aware of those emotions, turn ourselves towards the Lord. And that's again, a choosing a pathway of thought. The first one I want to notice here is fear. And the, the curious thing about fear is that there are some definite commands not to be afraid and not to be anxious. And we're told that perfect love casts out fear and we're no longer held in slavery by our fear of death. So there is a kind of fear that it's not good for us. Jesus, Jesus says um, uh, to look to him and not let our hearts be troubled or be afraid. We can trust in him. And so we can notice the clue that I'm feeling those fear, feelings of fear, but he'd actually, li actually like us to turn to him and that will help us to become more calm. But there is a good kind of fear, which is the fear of the Lord. And Psalm 34 talks about that as well as some of these other things that are in here. We should, we should have an appropriate reverential fear of the one who loves us. We're worth more to him than many sparrows. And we don't have to stay in anxiety because we can pray and we can rejoice and we can give thanks. We have to pray with thanks. We can come to God in the midst of whatever it is we're concerned about and he will restore us to a place of peace. Even if we don't have understanding, he will bring us into a place of peace in Christ Jesus. We're not told that anger in, in itself is bad, but it obviously is risky. We need to be careful that when we're angry about something, we don't allow ourselves to, to stay in an angry rumination, uh, which can take us into sin, uh, can keep us in an enduring posture of anger, and can possibly give the devil a foothold. Anger has a good function, potentially, because it can cause us, for example, to want to correct wrong. Uh, but we need to be careful with it. And Jesus says we uh, particularly should not be holding anger against another person because it can have a murder, murderous quality, which is a bit huge. Or we can have feelings of sadness. And I just want to notice that Jesus experienced these feelings of sadness and also of being rejected and of being despised. Um, and he himself took our iniquities upon him he was crushed for our, our sins. And the result of all that is our peace and his wounds lead to our healing. And I, I, I do want to notice again, peace and healing. God wants to bring us to peace, place of rest and also healing. And sometimes the wounds that we have are infected by these negative thoughts. And as we come to know the Lord in, in that place of healing, as we connect with him in that place, it becomes easier. It's almost like getting a splinter out of a wound that he would take the lie out of the wound. Again, it's, we're dependent on his actions and we cooperate with him because we were in fact dead, but he's made us alive by grace uh, and, and by gift. And he also comforts us. He who is the Holy Spirit, uh, also called comforter, comforts us and makes us able to comfort others. He accepts us and what Christ has done for us, and he makes us able to accept others, and we're commanded to do so. Just for a moment, to distinguish between two of those feelings that we often accord as 
bad feelings, guilt and shame. Uh, guilt is generally to do with action. Shame is generally to do with being. Uh, whereas if I've done something that I believe, whether that's true or not, is wrong, then that's an issue of guilt, or that others believe is wrong, that's an issue of guilt. Or if I think something's uniquely wrong with me or those to whom I belong, or others think so, um, that's an issue of shame. And they both have not very positive consequences. Uh, guilt usually has something to do with punishment and requires some kind of restitution, but it has a remedy and that's forgiveness. Uh, shame has a consequence of being ostracized or cut off. And we know that Jesus experienced being despised and rejected and the remedy is acceptance. So it, kind of pulling everything together, um, what will help us to be transformed by the renewal of our minds? Well, first of all, of course, our general spiritual disciplines, your, your, your ongoing daily, getting to know him better, communing with him, getting to know the word, fellowshiping with others and so on, and your ongoing practical self-care, you are a physical earthly body that needs sleep and food and so on. Secondly, um, that general disciples way, which we mentioned earlier, that's the, the turning from self, the repentance, the, the death to self, the being a living sacrifice to God, to whom we depend upon for resurrection life to help us. And we remind ourselves of Jesus's command to deny yourself if you wish to follow him and uh, take up the instrument of death, the cross, or be a living act, sacrifice on the altar and act to follow him from that position. And then we have the sacraments, baptism, where we're forever identified with that death and resurrection. We can have that as a marker in our own lives. And communion, which is something we can do regularly, uh, not only in terms of our, our prayer life, but also in terms of the act of taking the sacrament of communion, all about communing with him and doing so together as well. And then we choose what we think about, we and we can turn to him and act with him rather than trying to fix it all on ourselves. Uh, clothed, clothing ourselves with Christ, we choose not to think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Uh, in Philippians, we're told uh, not only to rejoice and pray, but to think on things that are good and noble and true and excellent and praiseworthy. And the God of peace will guard our minds in Christ Jesus. And First Peter says that we, we will experience uh, the, the devil attacking us or tempting us or lying to us, but we need to resist him standing firm in our faith. And in the Lord's Prayer, we're reminded in a, in a daily, wonderful, practical way, which I, I so appreciate this as a, a handle on how to pray, um, that we approach our Lord with honor as, his, as our Father who loves us and orienting ourselves to desire his will. And then there's certain kinds of requests which we need to make daily. We have a need of daily bread, which includes all kinds of, of food, provision, shelter, healing, and so on. We have a daily need to restore, to be restored in terms of forgiveness and reconciliation with God and with others, and to remind ourselves of where that needs to take place. And then we, we daily need to have help in things that could tempt us, which could come from the carnal nature, from the world, or from the evil one, and with deliverance when we get ensnared, deliverance from the evil one. And we're also to seek help from others. As James says, we can go to others, for example, when we're sick and we need prayer for healing, but also to confess our sins and pray for one another, pray, talk to each other about our weakness and our difficulty. Don't, don't just be alone in it. As Proverbs says, good friends sharpen one another and tell each other the truth. And as Matthew says, when two, two or three gather in his name, Jesus is in the midst. And we're reminded by both Jesus and by Paul that we're one body, we belong to each other, we need each other. So how can we be transformed? by all of these things that lead us to love what God loves and to love as God loves because we become able to test and approve what is God's good, perfect, and pleasing will. And it becomes entirely pleasing as we come to know him better and as he works on us and we, and we work with him. So thank you for your attention. And there's time now for you guys to ask questions if you have any. So I'll turn it back over to others.
Thank you so much, Judy. What a comprehensive talk on renewing the mind. Um, very much appreciated. I'm, I'm certainly encouraged by it. Um, so we have a few questions um, here. Um, and so the first one is, I'll just pull it up. Um, so Judy, what does our conformity to Christ look like? Is this that we will come into the image of God? Or as the Kabbalists say, equivalent in form with the creator? Um, so is this that we come into the image of God or as the Kabbalists say, equivalent in the form with the creator? If either of these are true, why would God have this as a purpose? There's a few questions in there. Um, I don't understand the, the second part of the question. I didn't quite, it's something to do with the Kabbalah. But yeah. I um, so I, I think it's um, from my understanding, it's, um, I guess what, what does conformity to Christ uh, look like is it that um, we'll come into the image of God or um, equivalent in form with the creator well we already already are the image of God so that's not that's not exactly the way to understand it you and I already are in his image but because of sin we are damaged and so there's there's only one who's ever been able to live a sinless life and that's Jesus and so we're being transformed to actually have the nature of, of holiness, the nature of submission to God. And, and I guess the, yeah, and I guess um, perhaps you've um, already answered the question, but I guess the follow-up part of it is um, what would, what's God's purpose in conforming us to, to his image? Well, uh, besides the fact that it's a place of freedom and joy and delight for us, and we'll get along with each other a whole heap better if we're not so awful to each other, um, it brings us into it brings us into intimacy with Jesus. The more that we are like Him, the more that we can actually uh, participate in that joyous sense of the Trinity with Him and with one another. Beautiful. Uh, and ne next question um, is: I've often wondered in what ways optimism has become a modern doctrine that distracts or even destroys the meaning and experience of the hope God provides. So I guess it's a statement, but there's a question in there. That's an interesting question. Um, it's interesting. I, I have just been reading some material by Martin Seligman and he's very optimistic in ways that I think are very unrealistic in terms of what, what he thinks is true about the world today. I think things are entirely different than how he is portraying them because I see this amazing dynamic that there's incredible hope because of who God is and because God brings all things together in the end and, and, and brings things right in the end. But I'm not optimistic that all things are just going to turn into a wonderful world here. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess different reasons for optimism or, or hope um, as a secular psychology versus, um, you know, a theological framework or a biblical framework. Yes. Um, Given the next question is given what we are learning about neuroplasticity, when the Apostle Paul says we can be transformed by the renewing of our minds, could it be that what happens in conversion is the development of new neural pathways? Oh, undoubtedly. Um, undoubtedly, that's an ongoing process as we are, are turning towards Christ and choosing not to follow the old pathways that he's definitely building new pathways in our mind, definitely changing the way our nervous system is working with better pathways, definitely. Hmm. I'm just um, pulling up the next question. Um, somebody's asked, um, and Judy, it's okay if you, if you, I'm not onto this one, but it says, how about, um, the other seven core emotions, are there any resources you could suggest um, that might deal with um, the other core emotions um, that we experience as people? I don't know if you're everything, I have read, everything I've read has actually limited it to a, a, a smaller group of emotions. So I'm not sure which emotions are being sure. referred to, but, but what I was referring to is what I have seen and the things that I have read in terms of the cross-cultural um, a recognizability and so on um but certainly you, you need to think who you are as as both bodies as, as body as well as soul and spirit that there's an interaction between what goes on in your body 
and your brain and your thought life and your emotion life and your spirit. It's all interactive. And if you've ever seen the books by Carolyn Greenleaf, she has some pictures in there of um, building new neural pathways. And it's, it's very exciting what people are becoming more aware of now that there's such a, a an, an embodied, we're embodied souls really as persons. Um, somebody's asked, are there any ways that you can suggest to reduce activity of the limbic system if you have an over overactive limbic system? Um, generally speaking, the tactics of mindfulness, which are becoming very present, uh, paying attention to your breath. One, one good thing about your breathing is it goes on without you thinking about it, but you can think about it and take charge of it. So you can slow down your breath. And, and as you slow down your breath, that can be a bit of a calming influence on your whole nervous system. And it does, it does matter what you think. So if you choose to think, um, the Lord is here, I am not, I'm not alone to face this, as opposed to, oh my goodness, I'm actually um, scared. Uh, it, just choosing those kind of thoughts can help as well as the focus on your, on your breath. Mm. Um, so you can intervene both um, through the mind and, and the body. Mm. Yes. Uh, next question is, um, with COVID, we're very cut off from each other and I'm all the way over in WA, so I'm kind of cut off from you anyway, Judith. But um, are there any tips that you might have uh, for looking after ourselves when we are alone and um, in, the, in the context of COVID? Wow, well, everyone's in, in different states of alone. Um, I, I really feel for those who live alone. I, I have lived alone in the past be, before I was married and I think it would be so much more difficult. I didn't get married till I was in middle adult years. So much more difficult for anyone who doesn't have a, a shared housemate. Um, so our advice is really to one another if there's somebody at all with us versus our next level of being cut off. But you can have somebody in a bubble so you can at least sometimes get together with someone. Um, but we can get together through screens and we can get together through phones. And at least that gives a little bit of an, act, an activeness. And you can join um, groups that are, that are interacting together and all this I found did reduce my sense of isolation, reduce our sense of isolation. Go out and walk where you can see people. <laughs> you know, there, there are things that can, can help. You can't, you can't replace ordinary human contact. This, this, this is what it is. And say, well, Lord, how can, how can I become closer to you because I don't have as many distractions of other people? Is that possible? Yeah. Thanks, Judy. Um, so next question is, so I'm just, um, just pulling it up. Um, so somebody's asked, and I'm a little bit ignorant about um, maybe this form of spirituality, but um, you might be a little bit more on the know, Judy. Is Judith able to please talk about the similarities, parallels between Ignatian spirituality and the modern mindfulness movement? Um, I'm not sure, if, are you familiar with? I, I can't, no, I know that there's a Ignatius um, spirituality, I'm pretty sure is, the, is a set of disciplines that people, that people do, but I've actually not ever practiced it. And, and so, I mean, I'm, I guess um, maybe just to edit the question a bit, uh, you know, uh, would you consider, like how would you, how does mindfulness sit with you, Judy, or how should we consider mindfulness, I guess, maybe from a biblical, um, perspective should we see it as um, something that can be in line with the gospel or um, I guess is it like an anti-gospel um, in a way we have a wonderful expert on mindfulness in our CTP community Catherine Thompson who'll be doing an all-day workshop on this very topic and has already done a webinar on this topic and has a book out on this topic um, but just to, in a very short view the the mindfulness that we're being taught by secular psychology is being referenced as, as um, connected to Buddhism. But there is a, the idea of Christian meditation, which is actually not just um, being meditating on oneself, but actually communing with God and meditating on his word. 
that kind of mindfulness has been around a lot longer. And that, that relational mind, mindfulness is Christian. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I guess I align with that, um, Judy, where um, a lot of these frameworks in some ways they can be redeemed, um, you know, through the gospel. Uh, another question is, could we say that it is the Holy Spirit who transforms us as we yield to him, despite whatever emotions that we might struggle with? I think it's that wonderful dynamic that we're, Paul says we're to keep in step with the Spirit. Uh, Jesus says we're to take his yoke upon us and, and um, the yoke is, is, is we're generally two walk together. That, that sense of being in an ongoing communion and cooperation, um, that is the way the Holy Spirit's transforming us, that we're doing it, he's doing it with us uh, together. I, I think I might've lost part of the question. Did I miss a piece of it? <laughs> Um, yeah, no, no, I think, yeah, is it, is it the whole, yeah, is it transforms us as we yield to him, um, despite whatever emotions I struggle with. So, you know, I think yeah. you are answering, answering it. Yeah, yeah I, I think so many times we, we can allow our, mo our emotions to be more dominantly predictive of what we will think, as opposed to asking God, could you please lift my eyes to you? And, um, and show me a way that I can start to think what you think. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. trust that our emotions will follow along. That's what cognitive behavioral theory at least is, that our emotions will follow along. But it's also true that we may have healing that we need from past traumatic experiences and, um, and things that we haven't even surfaced that we've believed that are not true, but they've been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, we also may need to uh, to find our way perhaps with help into a more experiential relationship with Jesus, which can be quite transformative. So it's, it's not just a, a cognitive process. It's, it's, a, it's a living out process with God actively meeting us. Mm -hmm. um, so um, look, that, that's all the questions that we have, Judy. Um, thank you so much for um, answering them. And, um, you know, the, I think there was quite a broad range of, of um, you know, topics there. Uh, thank you everyone so much for joining us tonight. We hope that it's been enriching for you and, and interesting. Uh, if you see in the chat, um, we've put some links up um, in, in ways to support um, the Centre for Theology and Psychology and also um, a link to the website. Um, there's also going to be some more webinars throughout the year and um, an email will be sent out um, just informing you about those. But um, just want to thank you again, Judy, um, for such a fantastic presentation and, um, and answering the questions. I can see some applause, some muted applause going on um, there, which is um, very lovely. And um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, it's been very encouraging to have so many people um, join us and um, yeah, have a, have a great evening. Excuse me, Greg, can I just say yes. one thing before we end? There was a question you told me about on the break, the, about, oh, about, okay. the, about our image of God. That, that's another thing we may need some healing and in, in to recognize that uh, sometimes we're, it's contaminated the way we see God by human experiences that have not yet um, yielded to a, a truer picture of God. So yes, that's a process. I. I really wanted to honor whoever asked that question because I know it's a part of our journey. Yeah. Sorry, Greg. <laughs> anyway, thank you, everyone. A, no, 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 that's okay. I got unmuted and now I've been, um, I got muted and now I'm unmuted again. But um, yeah, no, thank you so much. Yeah, so I think the question um, was along the lines of, yeah, can our psychology actually affect our view of God and our theology? And I guess you're saying, yeah, it, it, it can. And it's important to, I guess, clear that up. Yeah, um, we just, we need this and we need others. To help us absolutely. absolutely absolutely all right thank you so much and um yeah have a fantastic evening everyone thank you everyone thank you for the blessing of your company